In an emergency, there's no time to lose. Uh, unit 32, victim is a three-year-old male choking on an object. Roger that. 32 dispatched. <laughs> time out, 10.33 a.m. <laughs> But what would you do if there was no one to help? No paramedics or EMTs to perform life-saving techniques. No ambulance to provide immediate transportation to an emergency facility. No help. You're on your own, and he's counting on you. Unfortunately, there are no paramedics or ambulances to respond when your dog is in crises. And emergencies can happen anywhere, anytime. Knowing what to do should the occasion arise can save your dog's life. By the end of this tape, you will have learned several procedures you can use to save your dog's life and stabilize his condition in an emergency. The techniques are easy to use and, for the most part, simple to perform. The results couldn't be more rewarding. If you're like me, you find your dog's playfulness and curiosity a big part of what makes him so lovable. But those same qualities can also lead him into trouble in a world full of dangers which are often beyond his comprehension. Of course, prevention is the best medicine there is, and supervision is the best prevention when it comes to your dog's well-being. But no matter how diligent you are, accidents can happen. In many ways, your dog's anatomy is much like your own. His respiratory, cardiac, and central nervous systems function just like yours do, and his skeleton is more similar to yours than you might think. For this reason, many of the life-saving first aid techniques used in humans work just as well on dogs. But there are major differences between human and dog anatomy, and these differences necessitate specialized applications of the emergency medical technique. It is these specialized applications that we're going to learn today. By the end of this tape, you will have been shown the techniques for performing cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, which includes rescue breathing, the Heimlich maneuver to dislodge an object from your dog's throat, splinting a broken limb, controlling profuse bleeding, and what to do should your dog swallow poison. These techniques should allow you to competently and efficiently handle almost any emergency which may arise. If veterinary help is not nearby, they are the best chance your dog has to survive and go on to lead a happy and healthy life. Have any family member who may be responsible for your dog watch this tape with you. And whenever possible, have your dog nearby. There are techniques we're going to learn that you'll want to practice on him. Let's begin with CPR. CPR is a combination of chest compressions and rescue breathing used when your dog's heart has stopped and he's no longer breathing. This can be due to drowning, electrical shock, old age, drug overdose, head trauma, suffocation, and smoke inhalation. But the first thing to do is to check your dog's condition. You do not want to perform CPR if his heart is beating or he's breathing you can injure your dog by performing these techniques unnecessarily. Check for a heartbeat by placing your fingers, not your thumb, on the inside of your dog's thigh near his groin. Feel gently for a pulse coming from the artery which runs just underneath the skin. Or you can place the flat of your hand on his left hand side between his third and sixth ribs, just behind where the front leg attaches to the body. You can feel his heartbeat there. You can find the right place by bending his front leg up to his body. His elbow will point to where the heart is. Check for breathing by watching for the rise and fall of his chest and feeling and listening to breath leave his nostrils. Don't panic if it seems to take a while for there to be a breath. It is normal for resting or unconscious dogs to breathe very slowly, as few as one breath every 10 seconds. If you have your dog with you, try now to find his pulse. Remember, feel on the inside of his thigh near his groin. 
or feel for a heartbeat on his left hand side between his third and sixth ribs. Did you find it? Good. Now use the techniques we just learned to see if it's breathing. Watch for the rise and fall of his chest and feel and listen to breath leave his nostrils. Now that we know how to assess your dog, let's see what to do in case of a cardiac or respiratory emergency. There may be occasions when your dog's heart is still beating, but he stopped breathing. If that's the case, use only the rescue breathing we're about to learn. Use chest compressions in conjunction with rescue breathing only when he has no heartbeat. To begin with, you'll want to make sure that his airway is clear. If it's not, rescue breathing won't work as no air will be able to get past. If that's the case, you'll need to remove that object using a technique we'll learn later on. But if your dog's airway is clear and he still isn't breathing, take these steps to revive him. Lay your dog on his side and extend his head forward and slightly up. Hold his mouth closed and place your mouth over his nose. You may want to place a cloth, such as a handkerchief, over his nose. But if you do, make sure it's lightweight enough so that air will pass easily through. Next, give him two breaths into his nose. Each breath should last about a second and a half, and you should see his chest rise with each breath. If you don't, make sure that he doesn't have an airway obstruction, or try repositioning his neck before continuing. After two good, steady, deep breaths, check to see if your dog is breathing on his own. If he is, stop rescue breathing and bring him to your veterinarian. If your dog hasn't started breathing on his own, you'll need to continue at the rate of one breath every three seconds. That's 20 breaths a minute. You can count one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi if it helps you keep count. Keep it up as long as there is a pulse. As long as your dog's heart is beating, there is hope he will survive. If your dog has no heartbeat, then he also won't be breathing, and you'll need to perform chest compressions in conjunction with rescue breathing. The best way to perform chest compressions is to place the dog on his right side. Place the heel of your hand between his third and sixth ribs, just behind where his front leg attaches to his body, and put the other hand underneath his chest for support. Using a firm wrist thrust, compress his chest ten times in six seconds. and then check for a pulse. If you find a pulse, stop chest compressions immediately. If he still has no pulse, you'll need to continue at the rate of 10 beats every six seconds. That's 80 to 100 beats a minute. Stop and check every minute or so for a spontaneous pulse. If your dog's heart doesn't start beating within 10 to 15 minutes, you may have to presume that he is dead. Now remember, if your dog has no heartbeat, and he's not breathing, you'll need to perform both chest compressions and rescue breathing. If you're alone at the emergency site, you'll need to give 20 chest compressions followed by two rescue breaths. And continue the sequence. If there are two of you present, one gives 10 chest compressions after which the other gives one rescue breath and continue the sequence. Thank you, Kelly. It might help you to remember the steps by thinking of them as the ABCs. A, check for an open airway. B, give two breaths. And C, begin chest compressions. Simple as ABC. Also, in any situation where CPR is necessary, the kind of advanced life support only your veterinarian can provide should be started as soon as possible optimally within eight minutes. So your best bet is to get your dog to a car and perform CPR there while someone drives to your veterinarian or emergency care facility. Let's review. For resuscitation breathing, check for spontaneous breathing by watching chest rise and fall or noting the effects of exhalation. Make sure the airway is clear. Lay the dog on his right side. Tilt his head back. Hold his mouth closed and blow into the nose once every three seconds. Check status and continue until breathing resumes or too much time has passed. For chest compressions, check for pulse by feeling the inner thigh near the dog's groin. Lay the dog on his right side. Place the heel of your hand on his side by where his front leg joins his body. Press down 10 times and recheck for a pulse. Continue as needed, pressing 10 times every 6 seconds.
To perform both at once, do 10 compressions followed by two breaths. There are a lot of dangerous substances that your dog can get into. Certain plants and berries, cleaning products and disinfectants, gardening supplies, insecticides, fungicides, pest control poisons, medicines and grooming products, antifreeze, gasoline, propane and other car or fuel products, alcohol or liquor. Once again, the best treatment is prevention and your best defense against your dog's curiosity is to keep all harmful substances out of his reach. But dogs are inventive and it's conceivable that no matter how careful you are, he'll find a way to get himself into trouble. Since many poisons can kill quickly, it's important that you know how to recognize the signs of poisoning and what to do should it occur. Some common signs of poisoning are abdominal pain, salivating, vomiting which may be tinged with blood, lethargy, diarrhea, burns around the mouth, staggering, twitching, depression, convulsions, and coma. The symptoms vary according to what your dog has ingested, how much he's ingested, and how long it's been. And not all the symptoms will be present in every case. Your dog could exhibit only one or two signs, or none of them at all. If you suspect that your dog has been poisoned, but you are not sure, take him to your veterinarian immediately. Do not take any further action, because many problems can present with the same symptoms as poisoning, but will be made worse if treated in the same way. But if you see the poisoning occur or have clear evidence of it, such as residue around the mouth and a ripped open package nearby, you'll want to act immediately. He's in the poison! Quick, go get the hydrogen peroxide! This dog exhibits signs of having been poisoned. He's foaming around the mouth, has traces of green powder on his muzzle, and there's a ripped open package of rat poison nearby. His owners rightly decide to treat him for poisoning. To begin with, they approach the dog carefully. Some poisons can induce hallucinations or disoriented thinking, and a dog in this condition can lash out unknowingly. Always approach an injured or ill dog with care. You can't help the dog if you become injured as well. Okay, Bogey, everything's gonna be okay. All right. All right, all right. Next, they hold the dog securely yet gently. With a small dog, it can be helpful to wrap him in a blanket or towel. Now they're going to induce vomiting using common 3% hydrogen peroxide or serum of Ipecac, neither of which the dog is gonna wanna swallow. Firmly but gently, they hold his head up and his mouth closed. Pull his cheek pouch out and pour in the peroxide, about one teaspoon per 10 pounds of body weight. For Ipecac, it's one teaspoon per 10 pounds as well, but not to exceed three teaspoons. It won't take long before the dog begins to retch and throw up. He may throw up several times. He will almost certainly look at you with his best guilt-producing gaze. Just remember, this is for his own good. If he hasn't thrown up within five minutes, the treatment should be repeated. After the dog has stopped vomiting, his owners will take him to their vet or a nearby emergency facility for follow-up care. They'll bring along a sample of the type of poison the dog ingested, a sample of his vomit, or the package the poison was in. Your dog can also have contact effects from getting poisonous substances on her skin. Red, itchy, burned, blistered, swollen skin may be an indication of contact with a harmful substance. Kelly, with Braxton here, will show us what to do should this occur. Thoroughly wash the area with warm water and lots of soap. You should wear gloves in order to protect your own skin. Contact poisoning can be severely painful, crippling, disfiguring, even fatal if not treated quickly. So seek veterinary help immediately. Now let's review what to do in case of poisoning. Assume your dog has been poisoned if he's salivating, twitching, lethargic, depressed, vomiting or convulsing, and there is some evidence of his having ingested poison. Approach him carefully. Hold him securely. Administer hydrogen peroxide or serum of Ipecac to induce vomiting. Take him to a vet along with a sample to help determine any other needed treatments.
Many accidents occur when you and your dog are away from home. Unfamiliar territory contains unfamiliar dangers. It's in those situations that a cool head and an understanding of emergency procedures is most valuable. Good dog. One such accident could occur just this easily. Sheila, no! It can happen that quickly. Miles from home, from help, alone. Your dog is hurt. What do you do? Let's watch Peter show us the right steps to take. Knowing that even your own dog can be dangerous when hurt, Peter approaches carefully. He knows he can't help Sheila if he himself becomes injured. Even though Sheila seems calm and accepting of Peter's approach, Peter will still take the precaution of making a muzzle before examining her. Though she's okay now, should the exam become painful, Sheila could lash out. Peter will use a portion of Sheila's leash to fashion a muzzle. You can use any long, flexible cloth that's available, from a strip of towel or t-shirt to a length of rope, a necktie, or even a pair of nylons. If you have a first aid kit nearby, a flexible ace bandage works very well. Use something that won't abrade the dog's muzzle or cause her further discomfort. First, Peter makes a closed loop with a half knot and slips it over Sheila's nose. He pulls it secure, but not too tight, leaving just enough room for the dog's jaw to part slightly, but not so much that she can slip out of it. Next, Peter makes another closed loop with a half knot under the jaw. Then he completes the muzzle by tying a tight bow behind Sheila's ears. A few pats and some quiet reassurance helps ease Sheila's concern. Now, Peter will begin his examination of Sheila. He gently probes Sheila's body, feeling for swelling, tenderness, or a limb which is loose, dangling, or misshapen. He looks for blood, misaligned angles, and pays attention to the dog's behavior. Is it in pain? Is it collapsed or unable to hold weight on its hind legs? These are all symptoms of fractures. It's most common for dogs to fracture their legs, pelvis, lower jaw, or spine. Fractures range in severity from a hairline, which is a crack in the bone that doesn't penetrate through the full thickness, to a simple fracture in which the bone is broken through with one clean break. Severity then progresses to a multiple fracture in which the bone is broken into more than one piece. The worst kind of fracture is an open or compound fracture in which a piece of bone penetrates through the skin. Diagnosis of the type of fracture Sheila has will be up to Peter's vet. Peter's job is to protect Sheila from further injury by providing emergency treatment and safe transport. If transported improperly, a dog can sustain serious complications from a fractured bone. Depending on the severity of the break, these complications can range from infection to crippling to internal injury or even death. Peter has ascertained that Sheila most probably has broken her lower right front leg. Her limb causes Sheila pain and cannot bear weight. Peter will need to splint the leg to stabilize it for transport. What he wants to do is immobilize the leg, creating a means for holding it steady and straight. Any rigid straight object will serve in an emergency. A piece of wood or stick, a rolled up newspaper, a tent stake. Peter uses a folded magazine. Now he needs something to secure it with. An article of clothing, a piece of rope, an elastic bandage. Peter decides to use the remaining portion of Sheila's leash. He places the injured leg into the pocket of the folded magazine and gently ties it on. The idea is to secure the leg, but not too tightly. Just tightly enough that it won't slip around or move during transport. Now, Peter has to get Sheila to the car. Since he's alone, he'll have to carry Sheila. The best way for him to do this is to work his arms under Sheila and carry her, with one arm around her chest and the other in front of her back legs. If you have to carry your dog any distance and he's too heavy for you, you can use a fireman's carry. Lift the dog onto your back so that his front legs hang over one shoulder and his back legs over the other. 
hold his legs, though not an injured one, for support. If possible, your best transportation method is to make a stretcher. You can use a blanket, a board, a large towel, even a coat or jacket for this procedure. But you need two people. Lay the coat next to your dog on the ground. Place your hands underneath the dog's body and lift him onto the stretcher. You may want to grab the scruff of his neck to gain control. If need be, you can lay the stretcher behind him and carefully roll him over onto it. With one person holding the corners at each end, you can lift the dog and carry him to safety. Peter did a great job in assessing and treating Sheila's condition. But fractures of other bones aren't as easy to assess in the field, and they're potentially more dangerous. Fortunately, they're also more rare. Kelly and Cody here will help me show you a few points. If your dog is unable to use his hind legs, and there's no reaction when you pinch his toes, he may be suffering from a middle or lower spinal fracture. If he's unable to use any of his legs, he may be suffering from a neck fracture. Spinal fractures need to be handled very carefully to avoid causing further injury. Very slowly and very gingerly slide the dog onto a stretcher, supporting his weight fully from underneath. This is one case where you should not improvise. If you're alone and don't have what you need to help the dog handy, go get help, unless other injuries leave you fairly certain that delay will mean death. If your dog is unable to walk on his hind legs, but does have a reaction when you pinch his toes, or he walks very tentatively, favoring his hind legs, that may mean he has a pelvic fracture. Now there's no splint you can make for a pelvic fracture, so you're best to carry him just like you would for a broken limb. Or better yet, use a stretcher and bring him to your veterinarian. Now if he has a lower jaw fracture, if his teeth are out of alignment, he's bleeding from his mouth, or there's a gross deformity there, it won't require mobilization. The dog should be able to walk on his own and should be brought directly for veterinary care. Two quick notes. If your dog is acting oddly after trauma, transport him with his head elevated. Also, only splint distal limb fractures, those from the elbow or knee down. Trying to splint a higher up fracture may actually displace it more. Well, that's a lot of information, and it might seem a bit overwhelming, but it's really pretty simple and follows general rules of common sense. Let's review before we move on to talk about profuse bleeding. Always approach an injured conscious dog carefully. Fashion a muzzle by tying a long cloth or rope twice around her nose and fasten it behind her ears. Examine her for signs of fracture, including swelling, pain, holding a limb off the ground, dangling or misshapen limb, collapsed hind legs, or inability to move hind legs or all four legs. For a leg fracture, splint the leg by securing it to a rigid article. Carry the dog or place her on a stretcher and transport her for veterinary care. For a spinal fracture, grab the dog carefully by the scruff of the neck and pull her gently onto a stretcher and transport. For a fracture of the pelvis, carry the dog or place her on a stretcher and transport her. For a fracture of the lower jaw, lead the dog into a car and take her to the vets. Diagnosing bleeding is obviously quite easy. There's no mistaking those signs. Fortunately, learning the correct treatment is almost as simple. But the first thing you should do, should your dog be bleeding, is to remain calm. That's often the hardest part, as it can look scary. But panic will only make the situation worse. You won't be able to think clearly, and you'll lose precious time. So, should the occasion arise, take a deep breath and remain focused. This is Baby Girl. She and Kelly are going to help us demonstrate some techniques. The treatment for bleeding is pretty much the same in all cases. First, form a muzzle like we learned in the section on broken limbs. Bleeding dogs can hurt, and hurt dogs can lash out. Next, apply firm, steady pressure using a gauze pad when available, or anything else that's handy in an emergency. Cleanliness of the dressing is important, though, to help prevent infection. Throughout this section, you'll hear me use two terms, dressing and bandage. A dressing is applied directly over the wound. The bandage is used to hold the dressing in place and sometimes apply pressure. For a small cut that's only oozing slowly, apply the clean dressing to the wound and press with your fingers for about 10 seconds. It's okay if your dog appears fidgety. This may mean that she's not too hurt, but it can also make the treatment more difficult, so it helps to have two people, 
one to hold the dog while the other performs a treatment. After 10 seconds, remove the dressing and reevaluate the wound. If it's still bleeding, reapply the dressing for a longer period of time, say about 20 seconds. Continue this until the bleeding stops. In all cases, do not dab, wipe, or clean the wound until after the bleeding has stopped. These actions may make matters worse if performed prematurely. If blood is flowing freely from a wound, apply a pad using heavy direct pressure, like I'm doing on patches here. Secure the dressing in place using a wide adhesive tape if available, or any other substitute you can fabricate. I remember one dog was brought to me with a shirt sleeve tied around him holding the dressing in place. It's hard to say who looked funnier, the dog or his one-sleeved owner, but it sure worked. Use your own judgment in deciding whether the wound is severe enough to require veterinary attention, but leave the bandage in place for about 30 minutes before removing it to reevaluate the wound. If it's still bleeding at that point, reapply the bandage, and I'd recommend bringing him to a veterinarian. If bright red blood is spurting from a wound in a pulsating action, this indicates arterial bleeding and your dog may be in grave jeopardy. Act quickly but calmly. Apply strong pressure to the wound with a dressing and hold it in place for about 30 seconds. Wrap a bandage over top of the pad and leave the bandage in place. Keep your dog immobilized, preferably wrapped in a blanket or towel and bring them to your veterinarian or emergency care facility immediately. Do not remove the bandage even to reevaluate the wound. If you see blood seeping or oozing through the bandage, apply another more tightly wrapped bandage over top of the old one. Continue adding the bandages until the oozing stops. One caution. If you apply a pressure bandage to your dog for more than 20 minutes, check the limb below the bandage to make sure it's not swollen, cold, and still reacts to pain if pinched. A bandage applied too tightly can cut off all circulation and cause tissue damage. If this appears to be the case, rewrap the bandage, leaving the dressing in place a little more loosely. If your dog is bleeding from an inaccessible area, such as the inside of her nose, immobilize the dog and apply an ice pack then seek veterinary help. To quickly review, and you may want to practice on your own dog now. For minor bleeding, apply a dressing to the wound and hold it in place for about 10 seconds. Repeat as needed. For a wound where blood is flowing freely, apply heavy pressure to the site with the dressing for about 30 seconds, then secure the dressing with a bandage. Reevaluate after 30 minutes and reapply as needed. For a wound which is spurting arterial blood, apply strong pressure to the site for about 30 seconds. Secure the dressing with a bandage and transport your dog for emergency treatment. Apply additional bandage as needed. Do not dab, wipe, or clean a bleeding wound. Check the limbs to make sure circulation is not cut off by a too tight bandage. For an inaccessible wound, apply an ice pack and keep the dog still. Your dog's curiosity and exuberance can lead to several situations in which she might choke on a foreign object. Playing too vigorously with a ball that's too small for her, scrounging through garbage for morsels which wind up splintering and getting caught in the back of his throat, getting into mischief chewing on household items such as articles of clothing, or getting distracted while gulping down her food. The signs of choking include saliva dribbling from his mouth, loud, raspy breathing, clawing at the roof of his mouth, lack of any obvious signs of breathing, attempting to vomit or cough, or inability to close his mouth. If your dog is breathing reasonably well, you're best to leave the object in place and bring her to the veterinarian. But if she's collapsed, if her tongue is turning blue, or there's no obvious signs of breathing, you'll need to act quickly. Wedge something hard and unbreakable between her molars. The handle of a screwdriver works really well if available. If not, use a stick or something else which approximates its width. You'll be able to watch the back of her mouth, the roof of her mouth, and between her teeth. You can gently pull her tongue forward to reveal an object behind it. If her mouth is wedged open, you can use your finger to lever the object out. But remember, be careful. Your own safety comes first. You don't want to get bit. You can also use a needle nose plier. This works especially well if the dog's mouth is too small or your fingers are too big. 
the needle nose pliers can remove the object. If you're unable to remove the object from your dog's throat, you'll have to perform the canine equivalent of the Heimlich maneuver. With the dog lying on her side, place one hand on her back, and with the other hand in a fist, give her four quick abdominal thrusts. Follow that with a sharp slap on the back between her shoulder blades. And then check her mouth to see if the object's been dislodged. If not, you'll need to repeat the procedure. Give four quick abdominal thrusts. The thrust should be aimed up and in underneath the rib cage. And then give a sharp slap on the back. After which you'll need to swipe her mouth. Continue this procedure until the object comes loose. If possible, perform this procedure on the way to the veterinarian. That way, if you're unsuccessful, help will be more readily at hand. When you've succeeded in dislodging the object, check to see if your dog's breathing. Remember, watch for the rise and fall of her chest and feel for the exhalations leave her nostril. If she doesn't resume breathing on her own, you'll need to use resuscitation breathing to revive her. It's pretty simple, mostly common sense. If your dog shows signs of choking, wedge her mouth open and make a thorough inspection. Try to remove the object by hand or with a plier. Give four thrusting blows to the abdomen and one to the back, then reevaluate her condition. Continue as needed until the item is dislodged. Check for spontaneous breathing and perform resuscitation breathing as needed. That covers many of the emergency situations we see. With the information you now have, you should be better prepared to help your dog in a crisis. There is one last situation I want to discuss, however. It's an all too common tragedy and one of the simplest to prevent. Heat stroke. Dogs must have adequate ventilation and plenty of water when it's hot outside, or they could become overheated and may suffer brain damage or death. Signs of overheating include panting, gasping for air, distress, weakness, uncontrolled movements, and deep red gums. If your dog becomes overheated, get him out of the heat immediately. You can soak him in cool water or bring him to a cool, shady area and give him lots of water to drink. Follow up as soon as you can with veterinary care. It's a simple thing to know and treat, but absolutely crucial for your dog's well-being. Good boy, bro. Well, we've covered a lot of information. You may be feeling overwhelmed right now. It's probably a good idea to watch the tape at least one more time just to make sure the lessons stick. The techniques really aren't that difficult, and a lot of it is common sense. But having a solid grounding and knowing what to do can make all the difference in your ability to stay calm and focused should an emergency arise. A lot has been written about the roles dogs play in our lives. But you don't need me or anyone else to tell you how important your dog is to you. I hope that you never need to use any of the techniques we've learned, but if you do, I'm glad to have had this chance to help you help him. You were a good boy, Cody. You wanna go play? You wanna? Okay, let's go. <laughs>